On this episode of the Dr. Tina Show, I'm going to be talking all things thyroid. I mentioned the other day on my Instagram stories that I firmly believe all women over the age of 40 should consider some kind of medical thyroid support meeting medication, not just supplementation. And I got a lot of pushback. I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of concerns and I want to jump in today and explain why we're going to talk about thyroid physiology. I'm going to just speak with you basically how I talk to my patients. This is how I explain thyroid health and dysfunction to my patients. And so hopefully a lot of your questions will get answered in here. I got so many questions on Instagram when I put a question sticker up and I said, Hey, hit me with your thyroid questions. And I got a bazillion of them. So I have notes I'm prepared and I want to make sure that we cover as much as we can today. And if I can't get to it all, we'll do a part two, but I want you to understand your thyroid and why I made such a bold claim. So How the thyroid works is your pituitary gland drops TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It signals your thyroid, which lives in your throat here, little butterfly shaped organ to make T4. T4 then goes out of the thyroid and goes out into the periphery and converts into T3. T4 is a pre-hormone. T4 is the active hormone. So T4 is not active unless it converts into T3. Where a lot of folks run into trouble is they don't convert well. So we have conversion issues. The conversion, main sites of conversion are the liver, the gut, and the muscle. So if you've got a sluggish liver, which low thyroid can contribute to a sluggish liver. So it's kind of a vicious chicken and egg. Uh, If you drink a lot, if you have a fatty liver due to metabolic dysfunction, which I talk a lot about on this show. If you want to know more about metabolic health, go back and listen to any of my episodes. I talk about it at length. I also have a metabolic revamp toolkit that you can find on my website. I think it's a great offer and it'll get you the quick and dirty, but if your metabolic health is busted, I can tell you your thyroid is going to be in trouble. The gut converts it. A lot of folks have inflamed leaky guts. We have trouble there. And then the muscle, and you guys know how I feel about healthy muscle mass. That's a drum I beat constantly. If your skeletal muscle is not well-trained and active, and you are not actively working on it, you're going to have conversion issues there as well. So the standard of care for thyroid dysfunction, low thyroid, hypothyroid, there's hyperthyroid, which is excess. We're not going to talk about that today. That's a whole other beast. I'll mention it when I get into the autoimmune component of things, but the low or hypothyroid condition, very, very common. And the standard of care for that is Synthroid. It's a prescription medication called Synthroid. The generic name is levothyroxine. And a lot of you guys are on it. I know that is a T4 only drug. So remember when I said, if you're not actively converting into T3 somewhere in the body, you're not actually getting the active hormone. So a whole lot of you are on a drug that is the pre-hormone. That's not the active hormone. This drug got grandfathered in before the FDA ever existed way back in the day. And it's just always been the standard of care. I will preface all of this by saying the standards of care around thyroid health are barbaric. (laughs) I have no idea where or how it didn't get updated, but it is like in the dark ages, really. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more as we go through this episode. All right. So some common symptoms of low thyroid, some common symptoms of low thyroid. You may or may not think you have these symptoms. I did not fit the clinical picture. Keep in mind, I was rail thin stressed out of my mind, living off of cortisol in medical school as a single mom going to two programs concurrently. And I did not know I was low thyroid until somebody pointed it out. I just knew I was super anxious and depressed at the same time, which is a common symptom. Actually, uh, depression is in my opinion, one of the number one symptoms that's overlooked. It is insidious. In fact, if you look at the standard of care, they'll often say for depression to prescribe a SSRI, like Paxil or Prozac. And then they'll say to add a secondary one on that might maybe something that impacts norepinephrine, epinephrine, like a, you know, bupropion, wellbutrin type thing. Uh, And then third, they'll say add in T3. T3 is the active form of thyroid. So it is a known antidepressant. And the depression, I, I lived with it for years, years and years. The depression that low thyroid brings is indescribable. Nothing will touch it. 
Nothing will touch it. No amount of antidepressants, no amount of exercise, no amount of anything will touch it. And while living clean, exercising, and doing all the good stuff for our, ourselves will help improve our thyroid function. So we really are addressing the thyroid it can be a bit of a downward spiral. And so I highly encourage you, if you have depression, I should say, that has seemed untouchable by other measures and you're doing all the right things, consider talking to somebody about a full thyroid assessment. I'll tell you what that entails a little bit later. Brain fog is a big one. This is the way I describe it to my patients is, you know, on, I use Mac computers, I use Apple, and you know how the little wheel spins, or it might be an hourglass on a PC when your computer's stalling. That's exactly what your brain feels like when your thyroid's low. It's like you, I would be saying the same things all day long to patients. So it's almost, it's not scripted, but it's like, you could say it wrote, right? It's the same things I would say to every patient about basic treatment guidelines. And when my thyroid wasn't working, I just couldn't get the words out. I, I would forget words. I would, my tongue would actually get sluggish. Uh, my brain would get sluggish and stall. And it would be like the little hourglass spinning of death, you know, <laughs> just the little doom spin. And I couldn't get my brain to turn on. Speaking of tongues, your tongue might enlarge. And so when you, especially as folks get older and they have a hard time speaking or articulating, oftentimes I consider thyroid and you'll actually, you can actually see enlarged tongue. I've seen this on, Friends of mine in pictures smiling. I'm like, oh, they're hypothyroid. You can also see it. You can see it around the eyes. The eyes will look a little buggish, like a little bit bugged out. And at the same time, there'll be a puffiness around them. And it's a, they go concurrently. And so you'll see that a lot. I, that's how I know I am getting a little autoimmune. And I'm going to talk about the autoimmune component here because it's very common, is that my eyes will start to get a little bit bigger like buggish, uh, uh, just a tiny bit. No one else notices it, but me. And then I'll get a puff around the upper and lower lid. And that's very indicative of your thyroid being uh, struggle on the struggle bus. Let's see. Myxedema is a big one. So what is this? Myxedema happens secondary to hypothyroidism. It is a protonaceous swelling. It's different than a fluid swelling. It's a protonaceous swelling. And you might get pitting edema where you push your thumb into the front of your shin and a pit remains. That's myxedema. It's pretty dangerous because what I've seen clinically, and I don't have any studies to back this up, but this is what I saw in clinic all the time. My practice was primarily in regenerative injection therapies. And I treated musculoskeletal pain. That's what people came to know me for. I do believe that when thyroid is low and that myxedematous, uh, myxedema protonaceous swelling is happening, I think it's happening everywhere because I could see it under the ultrasound. I could see it. I literally would put my ultrasound probe down on someone and be like, Oh, you're hypothyroid. I could see it clear as day. And I'd have to show you the difference between healthy tissue and that to show you the difference. But most of my friends who do ultrasound type work, they don't, and I'm talking musculoskeletal ultrasound where we're using it as an imaging tool. Uh, they don't, they don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> when I ask them, but a, some astute ones have been like, oh yeah, I know what you're saying when I show them. So anyway, but I think it actually ends up surrounding our joints as well and putting pressure on them. And our joints are very sensitive to pressure. That's why barometric pressure hurts when there's weather changes. Some people will notice joint pain. Um, that's why we do better in dry climates that don't have high bio or barometric pressure, right? But here in Oregon, we get a lot of rain and clouds and that can really make people's joints hurt. And it'll also surround the spine. And so I will see nerve, what, what are, what's being perceived as nerve issues. And I actually think the nerves are getting squashed by this myxedematous goo. It's gooey to be totally frank with you. And when people are really hypothyroid, when I would pull their synovial fluid out of their joint, it would be thick and, and gelatinous. It should be, have a little bit of a gelatinous, you know, when you make jello and you're heating it in the pan for that first round, be, that first bit. And it, it's a, it's a bit, it's like really runny gelatinous. That's how your synovial fluid should be. That's healthy synovial fluid. When someone's hypothyroid, their synovial fluid's really, really thick. And it sometimes will have even protonaceous precipitate. So there'll be floaters in the synovial fluid. And it's causing a tremendous amount of pain for these folks. And their joints will swell, literally their joints will swell up and we'll have to drain some of it off before I can then go in and um, inject the regenerative solutions that I'm using. So it really does impact the musculoskeletal system. I'll talk more about that in just a second. There is hair loss is very common. I, I know everybody's complaining of hair loss with COVID. 
I actually think, yes, it could be a couple different issues, but I think at the end of the day, truly what we're seeing is COVID just takes people and puts them over the edge, whatever the edge they're on, it just sends them over the edge. So if you're on the edge of hypothyroidism, it's going to send you over the edge and your hair is going to start falling out. If you're on the edge of menopause, it's going to send you over the edge. And so it really is kind of that shove that's happening for people. And they come out the other side and they want to call it long COVID. I'm not dismissing long COVID, but you know, the NIH just announced this week, like they're no further along figuring it out. They've spent billions. They're no further along figuring it out than they were before. And if you go to any naturopathic doctor worth their salt or a functional medicine doctor who knows how to treat post-viral syndrome, um, none of this is like surprising to us. And all of those doctors are having great success with long COVID. And yet there's what, 5 million Americans that are suffering with it right now. I think it, what I'm trying to get at is at the end of the day, it, it's not so much long COVID as it is people getting shoved over the edge of whatever, whatever edge of pathology they were on. If they were hormonally unstable, if they were on the edge of menopause, if they were, you know, leaky gut, all of the things that maybe were, was kind of being maintained by homeostasis and then boom, COVID comes in and shoves them over the edge. So they're actually dealing with a whole bunch of different issues. And I think metabolic health being at the root of a lot of these it kind of shoves them further into pathology. All right, uh, eyebrow, lateral third of your eyebrow, lot hair loss, I, that's a thyroid symptom. Constipation is a big one, but I've also seen diarrhea, but mainly it's constipation. So if you're not pooping every day, every single day, you might wanna consider thyroid as an issue. And like I said, I was thin and it had the opposite symptom picture of people. I had the opposite of constipation. I uh, had the opposite of weight gain. Weight gain is another one. I wanna talk about that for just a minute. When my thyroid goes low, it's hard to catch it happening. This is difficult to describe, but imagine you have an eight cylinder engine and only four cylinders are firing. Your car is still going. And by the time I figure out, but it's happening in real time. And so my brain isn't working well. And by the time I figure out that my thyroid's low, I'm already past the alarm point, if you will. So I'm already dealing with the five pounds of weight gain going on 10, I'm already dealing with the depression and the low cognition and the confusion and the hair loss. And usually hair loss is one of the first indicators. And my thyroid just fell apart recently due to a medication switch. And my body did not like the new medication I tried. I'm going to talk about medication on this episode too. And my husband said, who's shedding in the shower? You know, jokingly, he said that, but he was like, honey, you've got a ton of hair loss in the drain. So that I should have, I mean, that was long before I started feeling the symptom picture of low thyroid. I'm just saying you get behind the, you kind of get behind the whole issue and it's hard to catch up. And so the weight gain can happen on that note, when you get properly medicated, because your thyroid is responsible for your metabolism and your metabolic turnover, meaning cellular metabolic turnover. So your skin will start to get coarse. You might struggle with acne. I often will get hyperkeratosis pilaris, which is the bumps on the arms. That's a big symptom for me. Everybody says that's related to how you're processing your fats and are you getting enough vitamin A and are you getting enough essential fatty acids? But I'm telling you, if your thyroid's low, you're not going to process your fatty acids well. And that's one of my first symptoms as I start getting the hyperkeratosis Polaris, which I've still got a little bit of that's residual coming off of this last, you know, thyroid debacle <laughs> I just went through, but I knew that I was in trouble when I started getting really, it started, my face skin started getting very coarse, bumpy, really bumpy and coarse. And I was like, uh Oh, this is bad. So, you know, the hair loss didn't concern me two months prior the low mood and depression. I just thought it was, well, it was, we had like six to eight weeks of rain here in Oregon. It was horrible. So I was just trying to get through that. And then, you know, a couple other symptoms, the weight gain started very quickly. And then of course, when my skin got very coarse on my face, I would, in my arms, I was like, okay, this is, I need to switch medications here. All right. So my backstory, just really quickly, I, and I'm going to talk about autoimmune, like I mentioned, I swung back and forth when I was younger. So starting probably in my college years, I would go from springtime, I'd get super hyper thyroid. So my thyroid would get revved up. I'd lose a ton of weight. Once the sun came out, I would lose a ton of weight. I'd get really, really skinny and usually down to like a size four. And we're not talking vanity size four because right now I'm in a size four and that's not accurate. 
that's, that's vanity sizing. I'm probably more of a, a, you know, if we were to do a true sizing with a tailor, I'm probably more of an eight or a 10. Actually, I was a size eight in 1987 and I was thinner than I am much smaller, I should say in size than I am now. So vanity sizing is a thing. So back then I would go down to a size four, <laughs> I were talking tiny, tiny. And then I would swing up to a tent and my closet was full of fours to tens because summer would creep along. And by the end of summer coming into fall, I would always dread the start of the school year. Cause I knew I was going to fall into a horrible depression, but I thought it was just school, but I love school. So it was very confusing. And I would, I would fall by the end of summer. My skin would be coarse. I would be struggling with acne and I'm talking on my arms, on my chest, on my legs um, coarseness and acne. And I would be so depressed and boom, school would start. And I'd be much bigger than I, when I left school. And this kept happening year after year. This was an autoimmune thyroid swing. I was going from Graves to Hashimoto's to Graves to Hashimoto's. I was going hyper to hypo, hyper to hypo. Uh, that was my thyroid being destroyed. A chunk of thyroid would be destroyed. A ton of hormone would be released. I would go hyper. And then eventually that would wear, run out and my thyroid would struggle bus along the summer. And then I would be in a hypothyroid state come the beginning of the school year. This condition affects just hypothyroidism. They say affects 20% of the general population. I think it's much higher than that. And it's 10 times more frequent in women. And 90% of that 20%, especially in women, 90% of those hypothyroid cases are autoimmune. So when women come in to my clinic or when they would, or now when folks pop into my DMs and they're like, well, I have Hashimoto's. I'm like, welcome to the club. Don't we all? <laughs> I can't, I, let's say more often than not, I saw Hashimoto's than, than not. So I always ran new patients, thyroid antibodies, because if you're looking for autoimmune disease, that's the cheapest antibody to run. It's the easiest to find. It's the cheapest to run on labs. I mean, as far as expenses go. And so if that was positive, welcome to the autoimmune rainbow, right? That means you now are autoimmune prone and, uh, other conditions associated with Hashimoto's or graves are like diabetes type one, celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Raynaud syndrome, vitiligo, welcome to the rainbow. And at the end of that rainbow is cancer. So if we have positive thyroid antibodies, we have an autoimmune condition. 90% of hypothyroid folks, especially women, are autoimmune. Let that sink in. You cannot cure autoimmune disease. I'm getting really tired of watching folks. It's influencers on the internet. And they're like, I cured my Hashimoto's and you can too. That is such a bunch of rubbish. You can't cure autoimmune disease. You can put it into remission. You can stop it from flaring, hopefully. So mine came, my, my recent dump out of my thyroid, that came about from an autoimmune flare. That came about from stress. That came about from eight weeks of rain. That came about from, you know, whatever else. But you can't, you can't cure Hashimoto's or Graves. You can mitigate it through good lifestyle management and you can help put it into remission, but it will rear its head the second things get out of whack again. So maybe it is the weather. Maybe it is a, maybe it's COVID or a virus, some other virus that gets you and you come out of it and you're like, Whoa, I was looking at pictures from my wedding. And while I was really thin and looked beautiful, my husband and I had just come out of a gnarly bout with the Delta variant. And if I look at pictures more closely from that trip, my eyes were a little buggy and puffy. So clearly it had sent me into a bit of a Hashimoto's flare. But yeah, you're not alone. If you have Hashimoto's, and I will say this with love, please stop using it as an excuse, like for not being able to lose weight or not being able to do this or not being able to do that. Like you have control over your autoimmune diseases. That is a topic for another day, but it is your lifestyle that is dictating how that autoimmune disease plays out. So what you're eating, how you're living, who you're living with, what job you have, how you're managing your stress, how you're exercising. Um, cause if you over-exercise, you're going to send yourself into a flare. So quit using Hashimoto's as a diagnosis. It's really that you have autoimmune disease and your autoimmune disease is either being well-managed or poorly managed. And there's no medication. There's no magical cure for this. I mean, sure. There's like low dose naltrexone that can help keep autoimmune issues in check, but there's no 
there's no magical cure. Somebody asked in my Instagram question, I'm severely gluten intolerant. What medication do I take? I'm like, you stop eating gluten. <laughs> like, duh, like just stop eating gluten. I, I don't, it's so weird to me that people want a medication to fix. There's no medication to fix autoimmune disease, you guys. So if you have Hashimoto's, and I'll say this part too, and this really is a topic for another day. If you have autoimmune disease, there's a very high likelihood, a lot of it's your own fault. No, we can't change that we had adverse childhood events. No, you know, I can't change the abuse that happened to me when I was young or the troubles that I've had uh, or the fact that I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day when I was a teenager. I can't take any of that back, but I'm telling you my crappy diet, my alcohol abuse, really. I mean, we drank a lot. I don't know what it was in Oregon in the nineties, but we drank a lot. I think it's all the rain. I, they, they still drink a lot here. People drink a lot here. It's dark here a lot. It's, it's an easy place to drink a lot of coffee and a lot of booze, um, particularly beer. We're like the microbrew capital of the world here. It was not honoring my sleep. It was eating just garbage. It was surrounding myself with garbage people. It was stressing myself out constantly. I induced and potentiated my autoimmune disease. I'm not saying it's anyone's fault. And every time I say this, people freak out on me. So save yourself the barrage of emails because I don't read them. My assistant just deletes them. But we really do induce our autoimmune diseases through our lifestyle. And so if you have an autoimmune disease and it's roaring, it is contingent on you doing the work to put that into a state of remission. And there's no amount of magical pills that are going to fix it. I mean, we can dabble with like some supplements here and this, this and that, but at the end of the day, it comes down to how you live your life. And I say that again with love, cause uh, boy, am I, uh, I'm my own worst enemy. This is why I know this I've lived this and I've treated thousands of people with this. So you cannot cure your autoimmune disease though. Let's just say that subclinical hypothyroidism shows itself as you might have labs ran and you will have normal T4 and T3 normal T4, normal T3, and mildly elevated TSH. And your doctor will tell you, forget about it. And I'm here to tell you, don't forget about it because there was a study I saw way back in like 2008 showing a way like 250% increased risk of heart attack in women with subclinical hypothyroidism. So this is not something to ignore. And before I really go into it, no, you cannot get off your medication. I'm gonna say that again. If you're on thyroid medication, so many of you wrote me and said, I've been on Synthroid for 20 years. I've been on Armour Thyroid for 30 years and I want to get off. No, you cannot get off of thyroid medication. There are some things we can go on and off of. I firmly believe that thyroid and testosterone are not them. <laughs> they, those men on testosterone, you're on it for life. Women, I think can, I don't want to get into the testosterone conversation, but I think women can cycle it. But if you're on thyroid, you're on thyroid. And I don't understand why anybody would want to get off of it. I joke, like if the zombie apocalypse happens, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be catching squirrels in the forest and sucking out their thyroid gland. Cause there's no way I'm going off thyroid hormone. There's no way it's a miserable existence. Even just having your thyroid low is a miserable existence. And I guarantee when I start talking about medication here in a second, a lot of you on thyroid medication are being under medicated. And so you still feel horrible and crummy. It's a miserable existence. There are so many things that I don't enjoy about my thyroid being low, notably all the things I just listed off before and the risk of so many issues over time. Like let's talk about pain. Musculoskeletal pain is super common in low thyroid function. It is very often overlooked by doctors. It's overlooked by chiropractors. It's overlooked by naturopaths. It's overlooked by medical doctors for sure. So these people are struggling with all kinds of musculoskeletal complaints, muscle pain, joint pain, migraines, chronic neck pain. Uh, migraines are a huge one. Headaches. All of those conditions I have seen resolve significantly with some high thyroid hormone. How do we dose it? I'll get to that in a second. And you may or may not like my answer because I'm not very specific. But I'm telling you, I have turned around every case of migraines that have come into my office with adequate thyroid hormone and the folks that don't want to take it or don't want to stay on it or aren't really good about, um, you know, they're just not compliant with it. Those folks cycle through their migraines, but 
I'm telling you, if you struggle with chronic musculoskeletal pain, very much consider finding yourself somebody to work with who can help you with your thyroid because it leads to all kinds of organ dysfunction. So I can imagine that there is inflammation coupled with that mixed edema, and that's probably happening around the nerves, potentially even the brain. We don't know. We do know that low thyroid leads to congestive heart failure because it enlarges the heart because the poor heart, your blood literally gets thick when your thyroid's low. So your, your liver gets sluggish, your blood gets sluggish, and your heart has to work overtime to try to pump against that. So we see blood pressure increases. We see cholesterol go up. Whenever somebody would come into my clinic with high cholesterol, they would say, oh, my doctor wants to put me on a statin. I'm like, actually, let's get some thyroid on board. And lo and behold, all of their lipids would mellow out. So so much of what we're treating as other conditions are actually, in my opinion, thyroid related. And it was a big joke in my city. Like everyone's like in Portland was like, oh, Tina thinks everyone has hypothyroidism or some kind of thyroid issue. And I'm like, yep, that's because they do. Dementia, elderly folks and dementia. I swear, I, I swear if we were to just give every single patient in an old folks home, a small dose of hormone. I, I don't even care if it's Synthroid, some kind of thyroid hormone. Every single day, we would start to see dementia rates go way, way down. So it is not like, this is why I'm saying you don't want to go off your thyroid hormone. If you're on it and you're like, I'm going to wean off it and do it naturally. Why do you want dementia? Do you want heart attacks? Do you want heart disease? Do you want enlarged heart? Do you want sluggish liver and liver issues? Do you want weight gain, which is going to lead to more metabolic dysfunction. Do you want, you know, messed up lipids, blood lipids? Like, heck no, I don't want any of that. So, all right. What labs to run TSH? That's the one coming out of the pituitary gland. So when T4 and T3 are high enough, it feeds back to the pituitary gland and it tells it to slow down. So if we have enough T4 and it's health, healthfully converting to T3, it should feed back up to the pituitary and it should keep your TSH on the low to normal side. If you're not making enough T4 or T3, the feedback loop will still signal, but the brain will start pumping out more TSH in order to get the gland to go. And so you'll see in a hypothyroid perfect world, we'll see a elevated TSH and low T free T4 and low free T3, but that's not what happens. I'm just here to tell you. So I'm not going to give you what ranges I want all the labs in. I will tell you that I want a TSH of one. If your TSH is above one, in my opinion, if you were my patient, I would treat on that and I would treat on clinical symptoms. And those two together would tell me if it was worth treating on, and then we would monitor you. And I don't know very many doctors who will treat this way. So I don't, and I, I really can't make any uh, personal referral. So please do not email me asking. Cause I, I have no idea. There is not a lot of doctors who treat this way, but my whole practice was musculoskeletal pain. So it was a really good gauge. If we got the thyroid hormone levels to the right spot, the pain would go away or it would significantly diminish. And that's how I knew we were on the right track. And so I could use pain as a gauge. And then I would monitor these people with labs, of course, to make sure we weren't causing any problems. And we would monitor, monitor them with physical exam and make sure we weren't having any heart palpitations or tachycardia or anything like that. But TSH of one, that's where I tried to keep it. And others will agree or disagree. That's okay. I had a very successful practice and I helped a lot of people. And that was my parameters. As far as where you want your free T4 and free T3, I have no idea. To me, those were less relevant. Uh, they Those markers are need to be looked at in addition to what the clinical symptom picture is. So those have to add together to something. This is why I don't encourage you to go do it yourself. You can run your labs yourself. You can go online and find lab companies that'll let you run your lab. You go somewhere, you get your blood drawn and you can order your own labs. But if you don't know how to interpret them and you don't know how to interpret them and actually look at them in conjunction with physical symptoms, then you're potentially you know, missing something. That's not good. We don't want you to miss something either way. We don't want you to be over or under. Being over can lead to cardiovascular disease. We don't want you cranked out on thyroid for a long time. That can lead to osteoporosis. It can lead to heart attacks. It can lead to all kinds of problems. So, but going back to the TSH, the one that's secreted out of the brain, it's kind of, it's so crazy because the, I think I haven't looked recently, but when I was in practice just a few years ago, it was 0.5, a normal TSH was considered a 0.5 to five 
which is crazy to me. That's like you going to the shoe store and saying, I'm a size eight and a half and they bring out a 13 and you're like, this doesn't fit me. And they're like, that's fine. It's still in the normal range. And you're like, but I can't walk well in it. And I'm, I'm, I'm tripping and I'm stumbling. And they're like, it's fine. It's in the normal range. Or they try to, you know, smash you into size five. And you're like, it doesn't fit. They're like, yeah, it's still in the normal range. You're fine. That's how they treat thyroid. It's crazy to me. So I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to tell you because if you want a practitioner who's good at this and who can help you, you're probably going to have to pay out of pocket and you you might have to travel out of state to be honest with you because even the docs that like we don't learn how to treat thyroid well in naturopathic school we don't learn hormones there unless people have taken training outside of school and this goes for functional medicine practitioners and the likes they don't really know how to do this either so we don't want you getting trapped trust me your md for all i love mds but most of them have absolutely no clue how to approach this or treat it so get away from the whole, well, a lot of people ask, how can I do this and get my insurance to pay for it? Like you have to get away from that mindset. Cause you're not going to find those people in your insurance policy, not anyone worth their salt. Anyone who's really good at what they do. Isn't going to accept insurance. Insurance sucks for the practitioner. It's like, they pay you 30 cents on the dollar. Why would anybody who's good at something accept 30 cents on the dollar? I mean, you wouldn't, right. If you, you, if you were a master at your craft, would you be like, I'm cool getting paid a third of what I'm worth. That's fine for the greater good. I, I don't think so. All right, so I also would encourage on labs, TPO antibodies and antithyroglobulin antibodies. Those are the two markers for autoimmune disease, which I said 90% of hypothyroid patients have. So check those. If they're positive, again, welcome to the autoimmune rainbow. Welcome to the club. Uh, welcome, we, there's many of us here. <laughs> if your labs are normal, I would still treat based on symptom picture. And that's legal to do, but most doctors won't do that. Most doctors won't even tell you that. So uh, if I have a clinical picture of symptoms that add up and this patient for all intents and purposes is screaming hypothyroidism and their labs are normal, I would still treat. I would still monitor carefully and I would still, you know, go by the book, but I would definitely treat. I am that way with hormones and most practitioners are not. So I don't know how to help you with that, but just know that if you feel off and your labs are normal, quote unquote, normal, keep looking, keep hunting. You will eventually stumble upon someone who can help you. I'm sure. And again, we can't cure the autoimmune component. So stop saying that and stop thinking you can heal from it. I love this word heal. I'm healing. It's always thrown around as like, people are in a perpetual healing state. It's like, when are you done healing? Because if you're living, you're constantly degrading tissues. So you're always healing. And it's just like, I feel like it's really overused. Yes. We're, we're on the journey to wellness. We're on the journey to more optimal health. And that's different for everybody. I mean, I'm never going to get back my thyroid gland that I've lost, but I can do the best with what I have. And with each passing year, I'm telling you, I need more and more thyroid hormone. My dose goes up and I have to play with it and I have to tinker around with it. And the same goes for seasonal change. Every time the seasons change, uh, patients I notice need much more thyroid hormone in the winter than they do in the summer. So I would, I was willing to work with my patients. They had to come in four times a year and we would change dosage depending on the season and symptoms. I was far more interested in symptoms than I was what their lab said, but most doctors have to cover their butts. You guys, they have to, so they're going to treat on labs. And that is the unfortunate situation is they're going to treat on labs. They can't treat on symptoms because they're not brave enough to, because they don't want to deal with their board. And most MDs, just to be totally straight with you, at least I know this isn't the case in Oregon. From what I've heard, I mean, again, I don't have a paper on this to prove it, but from what I've heard, the MDs, the medical doctors in Oregon aren't even allowed to use desiccated thyroid like armor or nature thyroid or NP thyroid, um, they get their license in trouble. So a lot of folks on the interwebs get mad and say, my doctor won't treat me. And my doctor won't even acknowledge it. They cannot their license, depending on what state you're in and it's different in every state, they're not even allowed to step out of the standard of care for this. I don't know why it is. I really have never figured this out. Like it is such a simple benign drug you get a little jazzy on it. If you take too much, you get a little tachycardic, meaning your heart rate goes up. You get a little bit too jazzy. Like you've had too much coffee and then you just lower the dose down. Like it is the safest drug compared to so many other drugs out there that they'll hand out like candy. But a lot of your doctors cannot do a darn thing to help you because if your labs are not off, they can't touch it. 
So please know that and quit vilifying them because it's not their fault. They don't feel like getting their license revoked for you. None of us got half a million dollars in debt to get our licenses revoked because one patient demanded we do something that we can't. As a naturopathic physician in Oregon, I enjoyed the ability to, I have a cool board and I enjoyed the ability to prescribe the way I did. And again, I was very much by the book and I had my labs to document what we were doing and, and I was careful with it all, of course. And I had patients track their heart rate and call in with any symptoms and, you know, we were, I was very, very careful with it, but I, again, was looking for symptom abatement. That's what would tell me the dosage. So I can't tell you, oh, start with this and take this much and this much. I mean, I'm not going to give recommended dosages anyway, because that's doing medicine on the internet, but symptom abatement was what I was looking for when they felt awesome. That was the ideal dosage of hormone. And then I would very carefully monitor that take a picture of that with laboratory markers to see what does that look like on labs. And here's the thing with Hashimoto's, you guys, if you're swinging, so you could run labs and your labs could look normal, but you maybe just got past the thyroid destruction point and you might be having a thyroid storm or the thyroid hormone maybe has all been used up. And now you've got a gland that's been wrecked a bit. And all this to say is when someone's got an autoimmune thyroid condition, which most do, it's very difficult for labs to actually add up to anything. So you see the pickle. I, I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer, but like this is a real pickle for a lot of patients. And it, and it leads me back to symptom abatement. And that takes me to the, what the drug of choice is for this. And I don't have one. I simply do not have one. Everybody feels different on everything. Some people feel amazing on Synthroid. Some people feel amazing on T3 only. Some people want the compounded versions of those because there's like fillers or ingredients in the pharmaceutical or the standard version that you get at the standard pharmacy. They don't want that. Some people love armor thyroid, which is a desiccated thyroid. Others argue that that's not standardized, which I disagree with, but there's corn in it. And then they love nature thyroid, and then they love NP thyroid. And the, so there's all these different versions of thyroid hormone. Uh, the list goes on. There's more than this, but these are the general main ones. Some people need their T4 and T3 ratios perfectly compounded and figured out. And it's this whole guessing game. It's exhausting. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you a favorite because I mix and match. I mix and match with patients. I would, I'm no longer in practice, so I don't, I'm not actively doing this, but I would maybe add a tiny bit of T3 on top of what they were currently taking. And that could have been whatever. Maybe they came in on Synthroid. We keep them on Synthroid. We add a little T3 to it. Maybe they're on Armour. We add a little T3 to it. Uh, I was, I switched to Nature Throid recently. It's, I don't even know if they're still manufacturing Nature Throid, but I had an old bottle. I ran out of my armor. I took the Nature Throid for about three weeks and boom. I mean, again, I was like behind the, behind the whole <laughs> figuring it out thing, a few steps behind, but that was not good for me. Nature Throid wasn't working and they had a whole formulation issue a few years ago. So that maybe that batch wasn't as active as other batches had been. But anyway, went back on armor. I'm tinkering around with using a little T4 or a little T3 with my armor. So I don't have a favorite lab range and I don't have a favorite drug or, you know, supplement even. I'll quickly mention supplements. I do not think you can do this with herbs alone. I do know that there are several supplements out there with thyroid glandular in them. If you feel awesome on those, good on you. I think that's great. I love glandulars, a uh, big fan. In Chinese medicine, you support the gland that's having, that's struggling with the gland of an animal. That's the same gland. So if there's stagnant thyroid, you give thyroid from an animal, right? So I love glandulars. I love the whole way of treating with glandulars, but I will say that I found that the glandulars can be often a lot more expensive at the dosages needed than if somebody just got prescribed desiccated thyroid as a prescription. So I'll leave it at that, whatever makes you feel better, but herbs, no herbs are complementary. All right. Herbs are going and if you're really young and herbs are working cool, but as you get older, I think this gets more difficult. And so this is where the 40 year old thing comes in. I really feel strongly that women, especially over 40 would do well with a little bit of thyroid hormone on board. And I mean, prescribed. I like desiccated. I like armor thyroid. I like desiccated. And I 
would often start them at maybe like an eighth of a gram or a quarter of a gram. I'm talking tiny little dosages and we would titrate up. That's always how I dosed people. I titrated them up until they got symptom abatement. So a little bit of thyroid hormone can make such a difference for all the reasons I've already listed, right? Most notably, we don't want you running around with subclinical hypothyroidism and being at risk for heart attack, plus having chronic pain or migraines or all these things that might just not be such an issue if you had a little bit of thyroid on board. And yes, the adrenal glands are important. And yes, the other hormones are important. And I'll probably have to save that for another podcast episode, but Thyroid is critical and you can crank the adrenals all day. And the, those folks will bonk if you don't give them some thyroid and they need it. If they need thyroid, they need thyroid. Conversely, if you crank the thyroid and folks don't want to treat their adrenals or take their supplements or be compliant about it, they're going to bonk. They're going to hit the wall because really the thyroid and adrenal glands are very much two sides of the same coin, if you will, when it comes to overall vitality and feeling well. So we want to support both systems for sure. And again, if you're taking even desiccated thyroid, that's a supplement, you're probably not going to get off of it. I, I, I really, I don't think people get off of adrenal support either though. So that's just my clinical opinion. I have probably treated more thyroid patients than most anyone I know, at least, I mean, literally that I know in my circle of colleagues, I treated often and I treated aggressively and because I treated pain. And so I was looking for symptom abatement and it worked so well that I had a lot of people on maybe a tiny, tiny bit of thyroid or maybe a higher dose as they got older. And it, it, I have no idea what they would ever need. I mean, I had some of the thinnest women need like two grains a day and I had big, huge guys need just a little touch. And if I gave them too much, they'd get really anxious. So that all that to say, I highly encourage you to if you strongly feel that this might be an issue for you, find somebody to work with, know that you're probably going to have to pay cash and you likely may have to travel some distance to find someone who can help you. I've got so much more that I want to cover with you. I will leave you with this. A high grain, high gluten diet is going to shoot you in the foot. So if you are Hashimoto's, if you've been diagnosed, or if you haven't been diagnosed, go get your antibodies ran. If they come up positive, you need to be avoiding gluten. We have a tremendous amount of studies showing the connection between gluten and autoimmune disease, but most notably gluten and Hashimoto. So gluten's out. I don't eat gluten. I don't think you should either. Grains can be problematic. And then the thing about thyroid that I've noted clinically and personally is that if you feed yourself all day long, meaning you're eating small meals all day long, I really think that sabotages your thyroid. I think thyroids like being intermittently fed. <laughs> so I eat two meals a day plus a snack. But when I was doing the whole, you know, 1990s, five meals, six meals a day, I was so hypothyroid and sluggish. So you do what makes you feel best, but consider giving your body a few hours of rest in between meals and see if that doesn't help your thyroid work a little bit better. I'm a big fan of, you guys know how I eat. The way I eat, that's my, that's my recommendation. If you have thyroid issues, you guys can check out my metabolic revamp toolkit. There's actually a, a ebook there. And then there's another recipe guide. And I talk all about how I eat. It's kind of a carnivore ish way of eating. Really. It's just the same way I've always eaten, which is low carb, uh, no ultra processed carbohydrates, of course, low sugar, low fruit. I do eat fruit, but I don't eat a ton. Um, it makes me fat. I don't eat a lot of honey. It makes me fat. So I, it's a, it sets off my metabolic syndrome. So my metabolic health is paramount. That is the root cause of everything in my opinion. So I keep that in check and then everything else falls into suit. So I'm never like eating a Hashimoto's diet. I'm eating a healthy metabolic health diet and that's high protein, low carbohydrate. As far as exercise, those with really struggling thyroids can't go do orange theory or CrossFit or run or do crazy cardio. And you know, I can't stand all those things anyway. If you don't know, go back and listen to my, uh, God, I've got probably a dozen episodes on strength training. <laughs> so somehow something about me metabolism, strength training, it's all in there. So I absolutely adore strength training. And when I started strength training regularly, personally, and I've seen this clinically with patients as well, when they really commit to the strength training process, plus walking lots of walks every day. Um, 
their antibodies declined significantly. Mine did too. Mine became almost non-existent. They do flare up when I get too stressed out or if I go through some kind of illness or if I go through a divorce or like something big, you know, uh, or I move, I have to move. I remember when I was moving my clinic and my thyroid fell apart, stress, stress, mitigate your stress, folks, find some mindfulness practices and mitigate your stress. But that is what I've got for you today. I know that's a lot. So go back and listen to this over again. And I will probably have to do a part two. If you would like to hear more, check out episode 38 of the Dr. Tina show. I had my good friend, Dr. Carolyn Stone on. The title is called Take Charge of Your Thyroid with Dr. Carolyn Stone. We're very much in alignment. She's written a whole book about this that you can go read and that should get you started as well. It's just a rehash of probably everything we talked about here to some degree. And then definitely check out my metabolic revamp toolkit. You can find that on my website. I'll make sure the links in the show notes. It's inexpensive. I highly, highly encourage you to grab it. And then there's the opportunity to buy a couple other courses there that will definitely help you out as well. And we will be back next week.